Okay, uh, final talk on the strand is back on stage. Uh, we're living with lovely place by replicating the dog box. Thank you. Sorry, you saw the slides, I'm going to skip them. A um, large part of the single is a compiler framework called Cleaver. And Alex already talked uh, about Cleaver yesterday, so I'm going to be very brief. It's meant to be adaptable to an implementation, so it provides possibilities for an uh, implementation to adapt the way the compiler works. At the same time, in order to avoid that the implementation would have to supply too, too much information, it is supposed to provide as many reasonable defaults as possible. Um, we intend to supply a complete library of existing uh, compiler optimizations that you can find in the literature, and uh, hopefully a few of our own. So the purpose of the current work is to avoid, avoid redundant tests. A test is redundant if you have a preceding identical test that dominates uh, the other one. Uh, domination is a formal graph theoretical concept that I'm not going to explain. Basically, it means that all paths can go, must go from one to the other. So you can eliminate the, the second one. The problem is how do you detect that you can. And so we do it by detecting the redundancy in intermediate code, basically the same kind of intermediate code that Alex presented to you yesterday. And we eliminate it using local graph rewriting, and I'll explain later what the advantages of that approach is. So the previous work, um, there is a paper from 1995 presented at PLBI that says about avoiding conditional branches by code replication. It's a very interesting paper. Um, it, it, it does avoid redundant tests. Yeah. It works on the, on the C language, and all the examples are transformations of source code of C to other source code of C. They appear to be using a completely ad hoc um, way of detecting when these redundant tests uh, exist. And I've, I've done a search a forward in time search of, of people referring to this paper have not found any kind of work done in this domain since. If I've missed something, please let me know. I would like to read about it. So um, let me take the same, basically the same example, except I use slightly different names here that uh, Alex used uh, yesterday. So we can imagine uh, car and trigger being implemented this way in a particular implementation. This is basically the exact implementation, both in, in class but in single. So a car is uh, testing whether it's a cons. In that case, it uses some even lower level primitive, in this case I call it cons car, that requires its argument to be a cons. And otherwise, if the argument is null, then it returns nil and otherwise he calls some error. And Twitter is basically the same way, except that he call, calls cons Twitter instead. And uh, in fact, what um, Alex presented yesterday is more precise in terms of what Cleaver does, but we'll get the picture. So now suppose we have the following code that we're going to compile. Let A, uh, car of X, B is some call to a function, and C is Twitter X. Um, what we're going to do is macro expand the car and the cutter, and then we're going to trace the type of the X variable here. The A, B, C we don't really care about, so they're not going to be present in the code. Everything, all the information presented is about X. So suppose you inline, um, I, said, I said macro expand, didn't I? I meant inline uh, car and cutter. You basically just put the code of the car and the cutter functions inside the, uh, the bindings of the left here, and this is the code that you get. And then what you do is you translate to the kind of HIR intermediate code that Alex talked about. And so you get something like this. And um, basically you can distinguish three parts here. This top part, is the implementation of car, 
And here's the um, middle binding of the let, and then here is the implementation of, of CURT. Now you can see that they're basically two identical blocks, and they, they're distinguished only by this cons cutter here and the cons car here. So I have marked the, the arts here, the control arts, with the type that we can know, uh, uh, the type of X that we can know at this point in the program. And the important thing is here, as you can see, cons P obviously divides it, the knowledge into cons and not cons, and you get finer and finer. But then they merge together here before the um, call to the function in the middle binding. So in fact, all we know about X at this point is that it's lips, that it's either cons P uh, or uh, either cons or not. And so that forces us to redo the test for cons P down here. Okay? And what we're going to do is replicate this middle, middle part, oops, replicate this middle part, oh, sorry. replicate this middle part so that we do not lose this type information, which will make it possible to remove the second one. These are the rewrite rules. I'm not going to go through them with you. I'm going to show you for each case. But this is just to show you that there are a few rules. They're easy to apply to our easy to implement. So let's start with um, the initial graph again. And this time, instead of giving you the type that is known uh, for x, I have marked the arcs either with true or false or nothing. And true, false, or nothing means we know the result of the test for cons p, and it's true. We know the results of the test for cons p is false, but we do not know the result for the test for cons p. So initially, all we know is the, the two the two arcs that come out of the cons p instruction, true and false. And what we're going to do is kind of take the second cons p and move it upwards. And there are certain restrictions, of course, that um, need to be there in order for you to be allowed to do that semantically. But those restrictions are, are very, um, uh, not very, um, doesn't, do not imply very many constraints. So you can basically always do it. It has to do with local functions that we call and so forth. So we, we're going to assume that the call is to a global function. So the rule five applies, which means that you can interchange the order between the cons p and the set q that precedes it, and stick the set q into uh, branches. That gives us this situation. And then the same rule applies again that says we can interchange the call and the cons p. So, and, and notice, of course, that the type information is preserved uh, in the outgoing arcs. So now we can duplicate the call into the two branches. And now there's a different rule that applies because the cons p has two predecessors. And in that case, we duplicate the cons p for as many predecessors as, as it has. It's a very simple, doesn't change semantics or anything. So you get this situation. And then we, so now we have two versions of the initial cons p. And we just pick one of them, the left one, let's say. Rule five applies again, which means we duplicate the set Q that proceeds into the branches. And then the rule uh, five applies again, which means we replicate the cons car into the two branches. And now we have a very interesting situation because the outgoing arc here is labeled true, and then we make a test as to whether it's true or false. Obviously, that can only have one result, which is true. So the right branch of this cons p can never be taken. So we can remove the cons p and just short circuit the, the arc. <clears throat> that leads to this situation. And now we have a cons p that cannot be reached from any um, control path from, from the initial function. So we can remove it. And in fact, we can remove everything that's not reachable, and we get this situation. 
And let me just continue doing this. The constant there rule 5 applies again. It will duplicate the set cube, duplicate the null, etc., etc. Just continue doing that. And then we do the same thing for the other te test, which is null. Yeah. And you just continue applying these rules, and this is the final result that you get. Yeah. So in, uh, as you can see, you have a single test for constant p, and you have uh, the replicated version of the middle binding here. So call and set cube here. Call and set cube here. Okay. Thing is that this this works for arbitrary code. We prove in the uh, paper that it works even if the middle code is a loop, for instance. It doesn't change it. So advantages, very simple to implement. Correctness is obvious because global rewriting, you just make sure that semantics is, uh, are preserved in each uh, rewrite rule. And like I said, the paper contains a proof, which was not trivial, but nothing very complex either. So we prove that it terminates. Uh, disadvantage is the code uh, is bigger, of course, because there is a replicated uh, path. The fear might be that if there are many overlapping liveness zones for different variables, then the intersection of all those zones might have a, an exponential blow up in size. Uh, we conjecture that this will almost never happen. And the last disadvantage that I've listed here is that um, there are probably more efficient ways of doing this in terms of the execution time of the compiler. So this is a simple way of doing it, but it might not be extremely uh, efficient. So the future work, um, because of this possible exponential code blow up, we need to establish some kind of uh, policy as to when, when to apply this transformation. The mechanism works, but we need to be sure that it will not uh, turn into something uh, extremely big. And we must implement this uh, technique, of course, into Cleaver and test it uh, in real life, in particular when it comes to the performance. So, So thanks to Philip Marek for reading the paper, and thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Uh, in slide eight, uh, you presented uh, three uh, well, uh, the body of uh, the lab. Uh, basically, uh, you have the uh, three variables there. Yes, yes. Uh, and B calls uh, some function. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, what happens if uh, some function mutates the value of x, which which implies that is that x is otherwise right. a, a, a accessible? Right. That's one of the conditions that must not be present. So that's one of the restrictions. But if uh, some function is, is a global function, it does not have access to lexical variables. Yes. So the thing is you restrict yourself to lexical variables and you cannot apply, uh, you cannot interchange things if um, closures that uh, capture the variable you're interested in could be modified. Yes, and my question is, uh, do you know uh, any, me any mechanisms right now uh, by which the compiler could know uh, whether uh, it is possible to apply this optimization or its dangerous? Well, it's, it's, al it's always, uh, these, these things are always um, undecidable, right? So, but, but it's quite easy to, to get a decidable approximation of it. You can just uh, recursive just say that an Alex will uh, have a good time. Uh, recursively uh, uh, analyze the, the nested functions and you conservatively assume that if there is a set queue to the variable then it might actually happen. So it, it's straightforward and not simple. Thank you. Sure. That's a question about slide uh, 19. What does it say? <laughs> <laughs> it's the right slide. It's the right number. 19. 
Further? I don't see it. I'm on 20, okay. How do you know? Oh, there it's in. <laughs> okay, in, in this case, the, the two tails of the chains are the same. Is that uh, common? And it, is it interesting to merge tails that are, that are the same? To reduce code size. Well, they're not exactly the same. What what what, it, uh, what is the same is the replicated middle, which is the call followed by the set key. The call set key. Yes. But and that okay. cannot be merged because, by definition, we re replicated it in order to um, avoid the second uh, text. So, by definition, there is going to be this code duplication. But the way you can think about it is, we capture the information that we need in the value of the program counter. And so obviously the program counter must have two different values in the two different branches. I don't know if that was the answer to my question I didn't understand or my question wasn't correct. But in this case, you, you get both with, with the safety operation. Oh, here, the, the, the last one. Right. Is that just a coincidence or could there be a happen to be a long tail that's the same, could they be merged, or is that just um, coincidence or unlikely, or? That's probably because it was already separate in the initial code. Those two set queues were separate in the initial code. So yeah, that's a different kind of optimization. <coughs> it's called, uh, I forget what it's called. You, uh, you basically uh, go to the same point in the code. The but these two were separate in the original code, so you Anyone else? Oh, thank you very much.